I've seen the ghost before. It was when I was working as a security guard over at the old Memorial Hospital before they tore it down. At that time, it was deserted and they were afraid some, some kids might try to set it on fire or, or cause some mischief, maybe. Wasn't, wasn't really much to do. I'd just walk around the halls once an hour. Uh, and one night I was on my rounds and I, I came around a corner and I, and I seen a woman in a nurse's uniform. I knew right away it was my Aunt Mary. Her hands were outstretched like maybe she was going to hug me or, or choke me. I couldn't tell. <laughs> her mouth was moving, but I couldn't tell what she was trying to say. I, I, I didn't know whether to, to cry or to scream, but I got out of there as soon as I could, I'll tell you that. Well, I believe the first time that I saw her hands was, was right after she passed. Nobody wanted to go into the house after, after all the mess. So I said I would go. And I was in there for a good part of the day, you know, sorting through her things, putting in boxes and gathering things in her bedroom. And you know how sometimes you can get that feeling that somebody is watching you? Well, I got that feeling. And I turned around, and there was Mary sitting in a rocking chair, rocking back and forth, you know, looking way off. And I wasn't scared so much as I was curious. So I says, Mary? <laughs> she didn't say nothing. She just kept rocking and rocking until she just, just stayed away. Huh? Is it on? Did you turn it on? <laughs> just speak into it? Now speak into the camera. Mama and Daddy and them owned that house next to Mary's. And Mama said that Mary was a, what? Nat natural? <laughs> Mama said that Mary was a strange woman keeping to herself most of the time. And uh, she worked second or third shift as a nurse. So, so there went many years that her and Mama didn't have any words at, at all. And then. After she retired, it, it seemed like Mama got a wild hair to go over there and invite her to church, you know, of a Wednesday night. And then after that, it seemed like her and Mama just kind of hit it off, you know. And of course, Mary didn't have a car, so Mama would drive her to different places, different chores, you know, like to take her to the grocery store or to the bank, that sort of thing, you know, that she needed help. And of course, uh, us kids were scared of her, see, or because she was scary looking. <laughs> she really was. She had that gray hair, you know, it looked like the wind blowing through a wheel, you know, will -o -wisp. And, 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 uh, <laughs> and she had them eyes, them eyes that they wouldn't look at you so much they just stare at you. You know what I mean? Like they're staring right through you. And she'd come over at dinner time and sit at the end of our table and, and, and just sit and stare at my daddy. Wouldn't eat a thing. Just sit there and stare. And Daddy says, I don't know what gets into that woman that won't come over here and stare at me while I'm a trying to eat my dinner. <laughs> and it made me lose my appetite. Now that's the truth. <laughs> now between the trips to the store and the bank, Mama started, or Mary started telling Mama about this new man friend she met named Jim. Well, now we all knew Jim well, because he was the butcher there in town. Now, he was technically married, although his wife lived in one of them nursery homes. You know, Mary would go over there and take care of her. Wash her hair out and brush it out real pretty and massage her legs, you know, and cut her toenails and fix them up so pretty. The whole time I'm hooting and hollering up over there with Jim. <laughs> well, one time I remember Mom went over to pick uh, Mary up. And Mary says, come in, Ruby, I want to talk to you. Sit down. So Mama sat down. She says, Jim's been a-cheating on me. Mama says, well, how'd you know? I said, well, I went over there to the butcher shop. And I seen under the windshield wiper there was a note written by some woman. She said, well, how'd you know? Did you read what it said? Said, no, that wasn't none of my business. I just know, she said. And then she gave her one of them looks. <laughs> well, I remember it wasn't too long after that. Uh, we, was, uh, we, we was going from school. Mom was picking us up from school, I remember. And, and she had Mary sitting up there in the front seat and me and Stuart sitting in the back staring at that old ugly head, you know. <laughs> and she leans over to Mother and she says, Ruby, I'm going to kill Jim. Just like she'd say, Ruby, I'm going for a walk. <laughs> Says, I'm going to shoot him once in the heart and once in the stomach, and I'll shoot myself four times in the stomach. That ought to do it, don't you reckon? Mama says, well, I reckon it would. But you don't want to do that now, Mary. That's crazy talking. What are you talking about? 
She says, well, I told Opal Avery the same thing. See, her and Opal had been friends from way back when they was girls, see. And she says, now, Ruby, I'll need your help. Mom says, I'm not about to help you. Why don't you go talk to the minister or something? Get this craziness out of your head, see. Well, it was of a Wednesday night, not too long after that, about a week and a half after that, I reckon. And uh, me and Stuart was sitting in, the, in our bedroom back there playing games and whatnot while the Dulce was uh, having uh, what's called the, the cottage prayer meeting. Uh, Frank and Joe, you boys making the documentary, you know what that is? It's a, it's a prayer meeting in the home. You should have known. If you went to the right church, you would have known. <laughs> anyway, so we, as they was having the prayer meeting, me and Stuart's in our room, and all of a sudden, in the backyard, we hear a bang, a gun went off over next door. Well, uh, I went and run, told Daddy, he went over, run over next door. And there stood Mary, sitting in her house, standing there in her house, goat, with that gun, still a smoke. And he says, what in the world's got into you shooting a gun off in the middle of the night? She says, well, I'm just detesting it. <laughs> then she shows him this box of bullets. She says, now, Charles, you reckon these will work in that gun? He took a look in and, you know, he says, yeah, I reckon they would. You know, he was so helpful that way. <laughs> And uh, then it went maybe two, three weeks after, maybe close to almost a month, I reckon, where Mary didn't say nothing to Mama. And Mama started thinking maybe she, you know, got her mad where she didn't speak. But, and then finally, uh, what happened was our, uh, our oven went out. See, Mama had her own little cake baking business there in town. She'd make, you know, little birthday cakes and, and you know, wedding cakes, just special occasion. And it was Valentine's Day, so we had a great big order that we had to fill. So I uh, went over there, and, and the oven went out, so we had to take all of them over there to Mary's house. Well, she's tickled to have us in, you know. And she sat us each down on the, on the couch there after we put the cakes in and gave us each a cup of coffee and started talking about how she was going to kill Jim again. And she says, she says, I'm she always all, all, all the same thing, once in the heart, once in the stomach, you know, and then herself four times in the stomach. And then she went in there to the other bedroom, brought out this great big old drawer, sat it between her and Mama. And she started taking things out of it, you know, like, uh, oh, they was old-timey pictures, I reckon, from her people way back. And she says, I want to make sure you take care of these. There's pictures of her mama, I reckon, and things. And then she brought out this uh, little this embroidering thing that I reckon her mama had sold. She said, I want to make sure you take care of that. And then she brought out that gun. She says, now, Ruby, I don't want you to touch it, for because you'll get your fingerprints on it. She says, I know it works, for because I tested it the other night, and I've got the bullets to match with it. Then she brings out this red bandana. And she says, now, Ruby, when I've done it, you'll know for because it'll be tied over there on the back door. She says, now, don't let the police come in and bang the door in. She says, just take this house key and give it to them. Let them, let them let themselves in. She said, then, if you could come over here and take these rings off my finger and give them to Sister Opal Avery. Mom says, I'm not about to come in this house and take no rings off of a dead woman. Now, Mary, just get this out of your head. About that time, the buzzer went off in there in the kitchen. So Mama said, Carlotta, go get them cakes home. So I took them home, and, and I went to bed. And I reckon after I went home, she took Mama, or she, she took Mama into her bedroom and showed her the dress she wanted to be buried in. Well, I couldn't get to sleep, and I heard Mama come in. And she come in to tuck me in, see. And, she, and she, I says, Mama, you don't reckon she's going to do it. Mama says, well, Carlotta, honey, I hope not. And then later that night, I heard Mama and Daddy whispering, about what they was going to do, you know, they know what they was going to do. Well, I remember it was of a Sunday, uh, three, four weeks after that, and uh, we was getting ready for church, and, and see, of course, from my bedroom, we could see Mary's uh, back door, so I seen that red bandana out there. So I went and rode, run, told Mom and Daddy, well, Daddy went run over there and banged on that door, and there she come to the door, not dead at all. <laughs> no, she says, I'm just testing you. <laughs> Well, then almost two, it must have been two months went by, I remember, because it was springtime, and she didn't say nothing, honey. She kept that house tied on a drum. Never went in or out, I don't even how she got groceries. And I was walking home from school, and I remember poor old Stuart, bless his heart, he's my brother. And, you know, he's kind of a big boy. He's big, broad in the back. I, I reckon all over, really. Uh, <laughs> But uh, he come a running. He was out of breath. He says, "Oh, oh, Carlotta, Mama says come run home quick. Mary's done it. Mary's done it." Well, I run all the way home, and there out in the yard, honey, was all the news people, and the sheriff, and the police, and everybody asking Mama questions. Well, I reckon what happened earlier that morning is Mama seen out the window there was Jim's truck out there all night, overnight. Never been that way before. 
Not only that, but there was that red bandana on the back door. So mama calls the police. She said, come over. They got the truck and the red bandana. Quick over here. And they said, well, we can't do nothing about the truck and a red bandana. You've got to see something substantial. She says, I'm not looking in that window for because that woman's got a gun. She's liable to shoot me. So mama called poor old sister Avery. Bless her heart. And she said she'd come, see. And bless her heart, she'd come over there. And we seen her peep up over the window. And her eyes got so big, you know, and she put her hand over her mouth. She'd come running. She said, oh, Ruby. Ruby, she's done it. I've seen a hand laying in a pool of blood. Well, I reckon when the police did let themselves in, she did exactly what she said she was going to do. Shot him once in the heart, once in the stomach, and herself four times in the stomach. Now, that's one determined woman. <laughs> now, you know, she ended up living in a coma for about two weeks after that. And that whole time, Mama said, you know, Carlotta, honey, I know it's awful, but I almost just wish she'd just go on and go on to die. Well, because if she lives, I'll have to go to court and testify over all this. And then finally, of course, as you know, she did die. Now, uh, now what bothered me, though, was they, that blood stain is still on that floor. They never got rid of it. It's still there. Matter of fact, the people that moved in just put carpet in over top of it. And that always did bother me. <laughs> this is all just a load of horse shit. I'm sorry. I know you're probably going to have to edit that out. But these people are pathetic. They're afraid, all right, but not of some ghost. They're afraid of the truth. They don't want to admit that when you and I die, that's it. Lights out. The soul ceases to exist. They want to believe in some happy little afterlife. You know, this ghost thing is their way of saying, screw you to science. <laughs> uh, science has taken away their little fantasy of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, and, and, and replaced it with Watson, Crick, and the double helix. <laughs> Not much of a trade. <laughs> so like spoiled children, they go covering their ears and run to a corner and say, shut up, or the ghost of Mary's going to get you. Well, I'm not afraid to die. <laughs> I certainly don't think my soul's going to flit about up there somewhere. Matter of fact, I told Carlotta the other day, I said, when I die, they can just throw my body up on some lonely old hill somewhere and let science and nature take care of the rest. Don't even bother closing my eyelids. It's not going to stop the ants and beetles turned into sockets soon enough. And uh, let a family of rodents find warmth in my rib cage. Let a pack of wolves finish off what's left of my arms and my legs. And let the flies finish off my, my mucus and my saliva. <laughs> Maybe I went a little too far. <laughs> Carlotta looked like she was going to throw up. <laughs> she said she'd pray for me and she'd hope she'd see me in heaven someday. I said, oh, well, that would be nice. But more than likely, you'd see me crawling out of some rat's ass. <laughs> <laughs> The way she was talking, I was wondering if she was a Christian or not. <laughs> y'all y'all remember the time I told you about that house on Guadar? Boy, something really good happened to me that happened. I was laying in bed of the night and I seen these two men come to the bed dressed like a Kung Klux Klan. Only it wasn't the Ku Klux Klan, but because they was wearing red. And the, but they still had the, uh, the eye hole and the pointy hat. And one of them, he held his hand out like that and had forehead. And the other one, he was pointing at me. He said, Stuart, you the one. Another one shook his head like that. And I said, OK, then, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> and after that, I could see ghosts everywhere. I'm proud I can see them. I ain't afraid of them. Except for when I see the ones that's mad about something, I don't care for them too much. <laughs> Midway Tennessee, what, uh, what makes it different? Uh, well, the name, the name for one. You see, uh, it got its name from being in the middle of uh, in Knoxville, in Nashville. Uh, see, uh, mid, Midway. <laughs> and uh, it started out as a trading post in 1802. And not long after that, then to see the railway come through here it proved to be a, a natural stopover. Of course, uh, uh, Robert E. Lee himself stayed in that hotel. You boys making the documentaries that uh, y'all uh, haven't seen his ghost there, have you? <laughs> <laughs>
I'm just kidding you, just kidding you. <laughs> anyway, eh, towards the turn of the century, see, tobacco became the main crop here. And of course, uh, it looks like, you know, that, that's all going to pot too with all the do-gooders not letting people smoke if they want to. <laughs> Which reminds me of the time this old boy from New York come down here. He, he tried to sell everybody knuckleberry bushes. Said it's going to be the crop of the future. Said you could make your own wine, your own shampoo, you know, just everything. And, uh, and of course, uh, this town bought it up. A lot, a lot of people spent a lot of money in it. And come springtime, wasn't nothing left but a bunch of big old dried sticks in the ground. And I think it kind of knocked the wind out of this town, so to speak. And it, it, it never really quite recovered from all that. It, it, matter of fact, uh, the only thing left after that is, uh, is Dick and Thelma's Tasty Freeze, and, and that's only open during the summers. <laughs> I don't want to write books, not really. I don't want to meet Elvis because I'm not interested in finding out what hell is like. I don't want it my way or my Burger King Whopper because my way don't work. Now I don't want to take from Evelyn Wood's speed reading course or sell fiberglass siding. I don't care about getting from point A to point B or making my sun don't shine smell fresh or escorting Drew Barrymore to a Backstreet Boys concert in the pits of hell. <laughs> I don't need some old boy from Rome to help get me there, neither. I don't want one free with two. I don't want to sail the ocean blue. I don't want to sit and listen to some old fool. I'm leaving town, see? Call me or don't call me. Leave a message on my answering machine. Please, look after my dog. His name is Dusty Joe. <laughs> Won't be need to take that paper no more, neither. Uh -uh, no, I'm stepping out. See, I won't need to be reading about all them killers no more, all them adulterers, adulterers, all them that goes to restaurants on Sunday. <laughs> I'll be able to hear them screaming from across the abyss, saying, Jesus, Jesus, please let Lazarus dip his finger in the water, cool our tongues with. She's going to overlook a big rock and say, I can finally hear you sinners now. I wonder why I didn't hear you before. Maybe I just stereos up too loud. <laughs> Nightmares and hellions in spandex all tight through the crotch, gyrating on our television sets, asking our children to come out and play. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> Farmers can't grow nothing but a big old hole in the ground. My wife's begonias started blooming in February this year. Now that's the truth, Ralph. And what does all this mean? Where does it lead us? When I was a boy, before I got saved, me and some old buddies of mine, we went out in this old car and we went on the highway and uh, this old boy I used to hang out with, he took old cassette tape, rolled the window down and let part of the tape catch in the wind and it was fluttering all the way down the highway. Is that all life is? Just a long, thin stretch of black? Roll it all up and there's no music on it? Well, I can't think that way. I won't. God is coming back, and you better believe it. This is the year of the Lord. Well, there's really not much to say. I guess Mary and I were friends, and we did things like other girls did during that time period. I guess I would say that Mary was a very caring person. That's why I think it was so natural for her to go into nursing. And you know, her parents sent her through nursing school, which at that time was, was very difficult. And, and she loved her job at the hospital. She, she especially liked working with the older people. And, uh, you know, she'd work second shift, the third shift. Sometimes she worked so much overtime, they had to send her home. See, she never married, so that, that job became her life. She had such a big heart to her. That, that's why I think it always bothered me that, that she did what she did. I do remember her saying, Opal, if I can't have him, no woman can. And I says, but Mary, he already has a wife. Besides, if you kill him, that's not what you want, is it? And she didn't say nothing. You know, after all these years, I, I wonder if this wasn't some sort of just a big show or a production for her. I don't know. Suspect is a 110-year-old Caucasian female, goes by the name of Mary. Possible aliases, haint, evil spirit, ghost, lost soul, <laughs> demon, witch from hell. <laughs> Appearance is a ghost of the grave, considered extremely dangerous. 
wanted for one count of murder, 16 counts of destruction of property, and 128 counts of unlawful trespass. I've never been visited by Mary, but I am well versed in matters spiritual. I'm self-taught in the area of tarot and runes, and I've recently completed a correspondence course in spiritual summoning. <laughs> Obviously, the question asked of me is, uh, why are you pursuing this case? Or why would a sheriff go chasing a ghost? Come up with an answer, I went back to the oath of office I took when I became sheriff. Said, I pledge to safeguard lives and property, protect the innocent from deception, the weak from oppression or intimidation, and the peaceful against violence or disruption. And does that apply in this case? Well, at the very least, this ghost has been threatening and intimidating people. There's no doubt that crimes have been committed here. The real question lies in the nature of the perpetrator. Now, people here in town, you know, they get a big kick out of it. They laugh. They say, well, Sam, what are you going to do even if you catch this ghost? Where are you going to put her? And I say, well, just because my jail can't contain a particular suspect, does that mean I should stop pursuing him? No. It means that I need to build a better jail. <laughs> Based on what I've heard, I feel connected to Mary. She didn't belong in that time or place, and, and she was terribly misunderstood and judged, as I have felt living here. <laughs> Suppose a tornado came by and hit your house. You may say, well, Sam, that's life, and go call the insurance agency. But if you could catch that tornado and take it to court, <laughs> would you do it? Of course you would. That's what I'm trying to do with this ghost. Now, I've been talking to these uh, ghost people boys down there at Atlanta, you know, at the college down there at uh, Paris, uh, they're Paris uh, legalists, and they're uh, <laughs> down there giving me tips on, you know, catching ghosts, and I've been trying to apply it to our case here in Midway. And, you know, I have to tell you, sometimes some of the things they tell me to do, I feel like I'm downright silly doing. But if, uh, if, if you was a sheriff and you had to catch ghosts, what would you do? So uh, what they've done recently is we have what's called the bubble test. And uh, I'm sure the people here in town are going to laugh at this one, too. But I'm sure people laughed at the lie detector test, too, huh? <laughs> so uh, this is called the bubble test. And uh, the idea is that you're supposed to blow the bubbles and they congregate in the area where the ghost was last uh, seen. And if you... Uh, <laughs> I want Mary to know that I understand, and I want to help lead her to the place where she can finally rest. I feel the best way of doing this is, is by having an old-fashioned seance right here in this town, by gathering the concerned citizens who live here so that we somehow channel Mary here so that she can communicate the feelings of, of loneliness and desperation I'm sure she must feel. I feel I'm a conduit for such a situation. <laughs> You heard how the sheriff got involved in this case? Oh yeah, he'll tell you that crap about his oath of office and all that. But the real story is he wasn't even interested in this case till it became known as Midway's Ghostbuster. They what was happening is there was this tourist here in town, one of the many that comes to snooping here, and they called up the sheriff's department about a ghost sighting. Well, Sam had a bad connection on his cell phone. Instead of hearing ghost sighting, he heard uh, girls fighting or gals fighting, you know, and he's the type of guy that gets into mud wrestling. I'm sure you can imagine that. <laughs> so he gets in the car, puts his lights and the siren on, the whole big production pulls up in my front yard, finds out it's a ghost sighting. Well. There happened to be this reporter here from People magazine who heard about this sheriff who was so vehement about chasing ghosts that within a week he was in the national press. Now you can't even watch an episode of the X-Files without him coming and peeping through your window. <laughs> the house was on the market for some time and nobody wanted to buy it, you see, so the price went way down. Then eventually somebody did buy it. I think it was a gentleman from out of town. Although I'm not completely sure that the, uh, the realtor was honest with him. And even after he found out what happened, he, he seemed to just shrug it off like it didn't matter. You see, I believe that a house can have a soul like a person, that it can be darkened by sin. And I can't help but think that he was affected by what happened in that house.
Well, I was a contractor for a realty company for a while, and uh, basically I was supposed to fix up the houses that were for sale. And uh, Mary's was one for quite some time. And uh, now I'm not one to easily be scared. And uh, I haven't ever seen Ari Hank. But uh, the night that I went over there to fix that pipe under her sink, I was a little bit afraid that night. See, I was over there and I was trying to tighten this, uh, this bolt up under the sink there. And as I went to reach for one of my tools, my toolbox slid all the way up and sits the side of the wall and my tools went out everywhere. Well, I got scared then. I got up and I tried to get out the door. Well, it was like it was jammed. It was almost like something or somebody was trying to keep me there, see? And I, I, I looked down, there was a hammer, so I banging it, banging it, banging it. Finally came up and I ran out and got in my car. When well, I looked back, I noticed I left that light on that house. Now, people, you know I'm not going back in there to turn that light off. <laughs> and just as I drove off, I seen the light go click like that. Now, that's the truth of what I'm telling you to my hand to God. Uh, the town bought this particular piece of property back in, in 1997 after this uh, national magazine came through here. And then uh, and not long after that, there was a little uh, tourist uh, magazine that wrote a little article about us. That's, uh, I got it here. It's, it's, uh, For those who are not easily spooked, a midway a population 1602 uh, has its own resident ghost. Uh, townsfolk claim that Bloody Mary, uh, whose life uh, came to a tragic end. Uh, still wanders the streets of Midway. <clears throat> After a tiring day of ghost busting, it stopped at Bloody Mary's Cafe. <clears throat> 115 West Carver Street. Did you get that right? All of it? Okay. Uh, for our tasty home cooked meal. Now, uh, we all thought that was funny here in town. We all got a kick out of it, you know, but, but, but I started noticing there started to be more traffic here in town. Well, some, some weeks the, the, the traffic be backed up for blocks. I started thinking, well, if we, if we played our cards right, this could be a, a wise investment for this town. You know, maybe, a, and you see, uh, jobs are hard to come by here, and, th and things were looking pretty bleak. So this looked like maybe it could be a, maybe a bright light at the end of a tunnel. Uh, so it didn't take much to convince the, the town council to buy this particular property and, and fix it up into, into a money-making haunted house. So uh, <laughs> here's what we have so far. Uh, this is the main house itself. In the, in the, here's the garage back here. And in the backyard, uh, we... we uh, we put some uh, uh, tombstones up, you know, with a hand, <laughs> maybe coming out like that. And then and, and, uh, and over to this side, uh, we, we put a bunch of uh, trees, you know, scary, hanging way, way over. And uh, in the front, we wanted to have something for the kids to, you know, involve a whole family. So we got one, uh, a little ghost that they cut your head through, get your picture took <laughs> for the kids. But, uh, but, uh, but the main thing, the main thing is, is, the, is the original blood stain itself is still there. Now, uh, we, we've touched it up just a little bit, <laughs> but it still has the same kind of impact to it. And uh, we projected uh, for the first year, we're going to charge $8 a head for adults and then five for the kids. And as you see, our bottom line here, it, it basically pays itself off after the first year. Not only that, once people get here, they got to eat, don't they? They got to buy gas, don't they? So by the year 2003, we are projecting of building a brand new hotel right here in our little Midway, Tennessee. Of course, the uh, grand opening of the haunted house is, is going to be here in a couple of weeks. Uh, Frank, Joe, Joe, y'all going to be there? Oh, good. I'll see you there. I'll see you there. <laughs> Have you seen the ghost? Have you seen the ghost? Oh, what a joy to live next door to that haunted house. Every day, a new troop of goopers comes over <laughs> with the same sad chant. Have you seen the ghost? One of them even came up and took a picture of me, asked me if I was part of the exhibit. <laughs> I says, exhibit? They act like it's a museum or something. I'll tell you what it is. It's a white trash Disneyland. That's what it is. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I mean, that thing's scary, all right, but it's not no scary in the way they ever intended. I mean, how desperate have we become when a bloodstain on the floor becomes the highlight of a family vacation? <laughs> I know, I know. You're probably saying I'm some angry old hag. But I came here after I retired to, to relax, you know, do some painting, maybe some gardening. And I have to contend with th this. Hey, get off my lawn with that Kentucky Fried Chicken. Have I seen the ghost? Yeah, I seen the ghost. She's a big, bad, naked lesbian who rides a Harley and drags tourists around like chicken bones. She wants a big government, she votes Democratic, and she never goes to church. Now that ought to scare him away. <laughs> I 
haven't had any enemies in my life. Virtually none. But I'll tell you what, Luann Wooten, honey, has gone out of her way to become one. I've been nothing but nice to her. I invite her to church socials and I give her, you know, pamphlets on the haunted house of what's going on. And she won't come. Excuse my French, but she thinks her poopy don't stink. <laughs> you know what? She's got money, honey. Yeah, she's made of money. She could up and afford to move anywhere else here in this town so we could make a parking lot over there, and she won't, out of spot. <laughs> you just have to give up on some people after a while. Well, well I reckon we, we really shouldn't talk about her, should we? We should pray for her. But then again, we do need to know specifically what to pray for, so let's keep talking. She's got a woman. <laughs> Carlotta, oh, that woman drives me insane. If she's not over here, invite me to her church thing. She's leaving those damn pamphlets flying all over my yard. Why, why don't they just let Mary die? Just let her die. Instead, they have to make a whole business of this thing. Matter of fact, I hear that the mayor has a new group here in town called Bloody Mary Enterprises. I said, yeah, they should make it easier on all of us and shorten it to BM Enterprises. Their slogan could be, we're full of shit. <laughs> Do you know what they want to do now with my house? They want to knock it down and make it a parking lot for that monstrosity over there. Matter of fact, the mayor comes over here himself and he tries to convince me. He says, oh, but Lou Ann, we, 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 we have to take opportunity with bo bo both hands and, and not let go. And I says, yeah, you can take opportunity with both hands, buddy, and shove it up your ass. <laughs> These people that say that Mary is a Casper, the friendly ghost kind of ghost, is wrong. That goes for them trying to make money off of her, too. They don't know what they're dealing with. Mary is an evil spirit from beyond the grave, and she's unpredictable. And you just don't mess with that. I can remember when a girlfriend and I were playing with one of these Ouija boards, you know, when we were kids there. And, and uh, you know, the whole time we're like, oh, are you moving it? I'm not moving. Are you sure you're not moving? I'm not moving. But let's be honest, we were pushing that thing all over the place. <laughs> and I kind of think that that's what's going on with this house, is this whole town has their hands on the magic indicator, you know, and it's moving, it's moving. Matter of fact, I hear some of them, uh, somebody is going to have a little seance here in town. Well, I say, well, good for them. You know, uh, it's always more fun to have a seance or see a ghost than it is to uh, watch a rerun of Matlock. <laughs> so, so the way it goes is a bunch of us been invited over to Buc 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 Bucky's place for, for a seance. I've never been to one of them before, so, so I figured to go and check it out uh, just to see you. I pictured a quiet evening, surrounded by those who, like myself, were enlightened enough to see through this thin veil of life onto the other side. <laughs> However, the group of people that showed up was not the group that I anticipated when I envisioned this spiritual enlightening experience. But we did need a, a group to channel the energy of Mary to us. He's full of hooey. Oh, my Lord, honey, here we were, grown adults, <laughs> sitting in the dark, and him a scribbling and a scribbling and a scribbling. You know what? He's just full of himself. That's what he is. It's a shame, my Lord. I thought it was pretty okay uh, to have good food, of a, <laughs> to have sandwiches, to have a devil ham. No, I mean, I mean the chicken devil ham, and to have a swamp dip. Boy, that's the best swim dip I ever had. But did you ever have any? It's good. <laughs> well, I figured I'd better go along just in case. You never know what's going to happen with them things. That boy's kind of quiet and weird, you know. He's got one of them uh, so, so cellular charts in his window, you know. And uh, matter of fact, I've seen one of them movies where they, uh, you know, the ghosts was throwing chairs and pots and pans and what have you around. So I figured I'd better pack my gun just in case. <laughs> now that the lights have been dimmed and the candle is lit, let us concentrate on the all-encompassing immortal warmth of the flame. It burns before us, brightening the room and beckoning to those on the other side. Come into the light, Mary. I need everybody to concentrate on Mary. 
welcome her to our circle. We are all of one flesh. We are all of one spirit. We are all of, of your community, and we bid you join us. Speak, speak to us, speak. Um, I'll just, I'll use this pen to bridge the gap. What words do you want us to know from beyond? What words of wisdom do you bring to us? Just tell me and, and I will be glad to write it down. Now more than ever, I need your help. Oh, there, did you feel it? It's a cold rush of wind from underneath the door. She's here. Oh, oh namaste. Namaste, Mary. <laughs> Welcome you to our circle. What, what's that? Oh, will I write down what you say? Oh, yes. Yes, of course, I'd be glad to be your messenger. Oh, oh, oh the pain to be among you and not be able to speak. Time is short. Beware of him. Who's him? You reckon she was talking about me? <laughs> reckon one the who turned the lights out. Oh, nobody turned the lights out, Stuart. My lord, Bucky blew the candle out. Please, we're still here, Mary. Just wait till we can find the matches. <laughs> well, I reckon I get up, get me some more swamp dip. Don't anybody move till we figure out what's going on. Everybody just stay in your seat. <laughs> if we stay in our seats, we'll be sitting in the darn dark the whole night. My lord, Sam. Please, everybody just join hands and concentrate on Mary. She's going to go away. I hate taggy by the but she ain't even here yet. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to continue your conjuring, Bucky. I know she was talking about me. I know it all along. I knew she was talking about me. Hey, did she say any names? If she did, I'll go over and arrest him right now. I mean it. <laughs> hey, somebody's tugging on my purse. Who is? I'm telling you, somebody is a tugging on my purse. Oh, they ain't nobody tugging on you purse to try to get out against the swip that my foot got caught on you purse. <laughs> I thought you was a pull on my leg. Oh, I wouldn't be pulling on your legs, Dork, my lord. Uh-oh. Mary is here now, buddy. And she sure might about something. <laughs> All right, who said that? <laughs> I mean, I ain't playing around anymore. Now, who done that? Did anybody understand what she was saying? Could anybody comprehend what she was trying to say? Oh, you made that sound, Bucky. You know you did. This is ridiculous. I ain't participating no more. Come on, Stuart, let's just go. I heard what she was saying. She said, I'm going to get you tonight. I'm going to get you tonight. She's talking about me, Bucky. I, I, I won't be able to go home. Can I just spend the night here with you? No, you cannot stay here with me. Now, please, everybody just, just Join hands and concentrate, and, and we'll try to. We'll, oh, oh, it's just ruined. It's ruined. You guys have ruined it. Oh, she's gone away, hasn't she? Yeah, she's gone now, buddy. Well, while y'all sitting here, I'll get up and get me some swim then. <laughs> I can remember when I was a little boy, my, my mother took us over to see my Aunt Mary. And, and there were a bunch of kids out playing in the yard. And, and, and you know how kids are, they were just playing around, they were saying things like, uh, uh, Mary has a big butt, Mary has a big butt. And, and you know how kids are, you gotta outdo the other one. So, so we all knew she was dating Jim the butcher, so I says, Mary has a, a thick, juicy butt to take. And, <laughs> And I, and I heard a door slam behind me, and I looked, and it was my Aunt Mary. She was looking at me real angry. And she didn't speak to me for some time after that. And, and, and I kind of think that's why she's mad at me now. <laughs> are we on? Are we hot? The mic's hot? Huh? Turn it up, Jim. Frank, you boys got it rolling? OK. <clears throat> uh, we are experiencing a revolution in Christianity and in this nation. Uh, charity is being replaced by opportunity and kindness is being cast aside in favor of accountability. Uh, we should no longer look for humanitarianism in old-fashioned humanitarianism. True humanitarianism is found in economic stimulation. Now, uh, the preachers of this new church are business owners. 
and uh, and our CEOs are the uh, are, are the uh, bishops are the CEOs of major corporations, and and our Pope is the chairman of the Federal Reserve. Uh, you know, I I remember seeing some nuns in Lexington handing out soup in a soup line, and and I started thinking, well, you know, I, I bet that's good for them nuns. But what well, about the people in line? You know, what those nuns should be doing is maybe coming up with a tasty product that they could market and sell to local stores. Then they could get those people out of the line and into the kitchen. Uh, don't hand a person a bowl of soup. Hand that person an apron and say, you're hired. <laughs> Excuse me? Well, I'm, I'm just trying to read this thing that B Bucky gave me the other night after the seance. He said, I'm supposed to read it if Mary comes around. It's, but uh, I don't know, I don't understand it completely. I don't know about it. I gave him a passage from Shakespeare's Eternal Hamlet. It seemed fitting for his particular situation. He seemed so distraught after the other night's proceedings. And after I gave it to him, he appeared immediately calmed by its contents. <laughs> I have no idea what it means. But uh, Bucky, he, he told me to read it. And, but I keep practicing it. It just don't sound right. It just don't come out right. But uh, oh, you want me to read it? OK. Um, but, but, but soft. Lo, it comes again. I'll cross it. Lo, it blasts me. Stay illusion. <laughs> if thou hast any sound or use of voice, speak to me. If there be any good thing to be done that to thee do ease and grace to me, speak to me. If thou art privy, privy, to thy county, country's fate, which foreknowing, happily foreknowing, may avoid. Oh, oh, speak. <laughs> if thou hast extorted in thy life, abhorred treasure from the womb of earth, for which they say you spirits oft walk in death, speak of it, stay and speak. <laughs> I keep practicing in it, but it just don't sound right. It just, it just don't come out right. But. But, but Bucky said it would help me in the healing process. He said, he said it would clear my third chakra. <laughs> uh, are we ready? OK. Uh, I would like to take this time to welcome everybody to the grand opening of Mary's Haunted House. And uh, as many of you know, this is the first new business that's to come here in over four years. And we're very proud of all the hard work that's brought us to this day. Uh, uh, but you know what? I really feel, people, that we are on the verge of an economic resurrection. Uh, we should take uh, opportunity with both hands and not let go. Uh, but before we cut the ribbon and begin the proceedings and have a, a Sister Ronnie to play the wonderful special that she's prepared on the organ, uh, I would like to thank the one person who's done more than anybody else here to bring us to this day. And that's Mary herself. Uh, Mary, we know you're out there, and, and we want to we wanna thank you for helping our town. Uh, we no longer see you as an as a evil spirit, uh, more like a, an economic angel <laughs> guiding us toward physical salvation. <laughs> I tell you, I think it's sad. These people seem to have forgotten that Mary was a real person, and she was very upset and disturbed. But most of all, she was my very dear and close friend. Um, I've taken a job at the haunted house. It's kind of an acting job. I perform the reenactment of traditional spiritual summoning, and I wear the authentic garb of a Middle Eastern mystic. Um, <laughs> I see it as my way of educating others about the other side. <laughs> um, I, I played the ghost of Mary, uh, but it didn't go too well. I just did it for one day. Uh, I hid behind a curtain, and I had a sheet on, and I was supposed to come behind the curtain when Bucky said, uh, come into the light, Mary. Uh, but I uh, tripped over the block I was supposed to step on and fell on Bucky's head and knocked his turban off. It was terrible. <laughs> I prefer not to speak about it. Turn the cameras off. Turn it off. Well, uh, uh, this here is my popsicle stand. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, over here is where we got the popcorn. 
I'm uh, down here in this cooler. They got all kinds of Coca Cola. Uh, they got the Sprite Coca Cola, Root Beer Coca Cola, <laughs> Orange Coca Cola, and Diet Coca Cola. <laughs> and uh, this here is my apron that give me the war. And uh, here's my hat with the pen and my name on it. And uh, my sister Carlotta got me my brand new shoe. It's pretty good, I like it, it's fun. Well, they got good popsicles. This one here uh, is cherry, and it, it's going for a dollar. No, I mean a dollar and a quarter. And this one with the nuts on it is a, is a dollar and 75. It's fun, I like it. It's, and the boy, they got good popsicles. Y'all want to buy one? Well, I quit, my, I quit my job at the thrift store and I work here at the ticket booth now. Yeah, it's pretty good, I like it. Yeah, just a minute, yeah, come here. How many of, how many of there is you? Three, three adults and the two children, there you are. There you go. Hey, where y'all from? Huh? Alabama. They come from everywhere, don't they? They should, oh, yeah, yeah, go over there, honey, and uh, let the little children put their head through that ghost over there. Yeah, oh, I hope they don't. Put them popsicle wrappers on Lou Anne's yard. You know, she's, she's liable to chuck rocks at them. She's spiteful that way. <laughs> I loved it. I thought it was the best thing I'd ever seen since they had the junior samples wing of the Hee Haw Museum that opened. I can't wait to see the expansion they're going to have next year. Yeah, I loved it. It was great. I took my son, Paul. He cried the whole way through. It made him very nervous. It's not for children. Don't take your children. Come on, Paul, let's get some coffee, honey. <laughs> um, I thought it was all right. You know, it was kind of good until uh, I got to that part where this, they had this old dude fall on the other guy's head. <laughs> that made me pretty darn angry. And they're lucky I didn't start punching people because I have an Irish temper. Apparently, somebody was up to no good last night. Wearing this particular garb and this mask, the assailant went over to Lou Ann Wooten's house and, what? Oh, y'all want me to put the, put the mask on? I just talked to one over there and the one under the head under the thing and just took that, ooh, ooh. I don't know, they went over there and they took the nice little suit off of the horse and I continue my investigation at this point. Uh, I found this mask and sheet in yonder bush. <laughs> well, I was washing dishes in my kitchen. You know, mind my own business. And all of a sudden, I see this person jump up with a mask and a sheet on. I guess, <laughs> ridiculous. I guess they were trying to scare me away. I wasn't scared, you know. I mean, I just called the police. Either that or maybe they, uh, they, were, they were trying to stir up another ghost sighting. You know, they were saying something like, uh, boo, boo, or maybe it was loo, loo. I couldn't understand it. <laughs> anyway, it's just ridiculous. This is exactly what I have to put up with, another ghost sighting. <sighs> Isn't that something? Them coming over here and blaming me, a grown woman, of wearing that mask and sheet and them big ugly hands and the fake blood of the knife and the huh? Oh, they didn't find the blood of the night. But she? <laughs> I don't know who done it, buddy. But God knows who done it. And here I hope he's finding him. When they do, I hope they stick him in the state from the teacher. <laughs> what a grotesque display of immaturity and ignorance of the afterlife. This is exactly the type of passive-aggressive behavior I have to deal with living here. These people just made a, a mockery of Mary's spiritual displacement. <laughs> I didn't do it. I didn't do it. But I think the sheriff came over here blaming me. You know, I have no reason to hurt her. because He, he came over blaming me because of the other night the seance. She said, beware of him. But, but it wasn't me. But, but I think I know who did it. Carlotta did it. But don't put that on the camera. <laughs> I saw something interesting the other day. Birds migrating north for the winter. I'm waiting for the whistle to blow. Not for a time out, mind you, but for the end of the game. <laughs> I uh, understand that the Pope is a best-selling author. 
Well, I don't want to be a writer. I don't want my teeth shine brighter. I don't want to butcher God and package him in some paperback for some fools named Barnes and Nobles. Is that what uh, religion is nowadays? If so, we should let poor old Bob Hope be the Pope. Then we could have uh, Hope on a Pope rope. You'd like that, wouldn't you? <laughs> If you want answers, go to the devil. He's got an answer for everything. The beast has a new number. 90210. <laughs> Satan is Seinfeld, Beelzebub is Baywatch, Godspell, Hair, I don't care. Prepare you the way of the devil. <laughs> what I want to talk about today has no Hollywood hype there, mister. Ain't no nudie show here. Just plain words for plain folks. Eight dollars a head, five for the kids, knuckleberry bushes and a bloodstained floor. You shall be consumed in the fire. Oh, Mary, Mary, please come into the light. I am uh, continuing my investigation, trying to figure out whoever wore this sheet and the mask. We're thinking it could be a fugitive from the law. Uh, just a second. Here, Sam. What? Oh, my God, I'll be right over. Well, the coals ain't even cold yet, and they've been over here asking me where I was, what I was doing last night. And I can tell you right now, I did not set that house on fire, although I feel a certain amount of triumph that justice has been served. And I told the sheriff the same thing. You know, nobody was in that house. Nobody got hurt. You know, it's interesting, they wanted to, to knock my house down, and make it a parking lot, and now that one's the one leveled to the ground. And I don't feel too bad this morning. <laughs> well, I was laying in bed up at night, and I seen them two men come to bed like a Ku Klux Klan, only wasn't the Ku Klux Klan. Only this time, Mira was with them, and she sat next to me on the bed. So she put her arm around me, and she said, Stuart, I'm going to need your help, buddy. It's going to be OK. And then she put her hand over my eye. And when she took it off, I was standing in Mary's haunted house. And she went around setting fire to everything, to the carpet and to the curtains. And then she went over and set the blood stain on fire. I don't know why she done that. And then she come over and put her hand back over my eye. And when she took it off again, I was sitting on my own bed again. She says, Stuart, it's going to be OK, but. And then I looked down, and I seen my hands was black, and my pajamas was black, and even my feet was black. I don't know why she done that, buddy. That's the biggest thing I ever seen. Isn't that something? Poor old Stuart saying he's done it. Now, I know he's my brother and all, but he can barely make a TV dinner, let alone set something on fire. <laughs> now, why would he set fire to the only job poor thing's ever had? I'll tell you who's done it. Luann Wooten's done it. Go over there and arrest her right now. Stop the cups on her. She's ruined every good thing we've ever had in this town. You know, she better watch it. It's going to come back to her, you know, because it's two or three hundred folds. Somebody's liable to set her house on fire. Now, that's not me talking. That's God. Because <laughs> it says in the Bible, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. She better watch it. It's going to get her. Mm -mm -mm. I really don't know what to say. I think it's very, very sad. I haven't heard if it was arson or from natural causes. But if it was arson, what a sad, sad thing. You know, this town wasn't always this way. People used to take care of each other and look out for each other. It wasn't all this arson and destructive behavior. It seems like people have become wrapped up in their own needs and, and greed. Well, it's one thing I really hope. I hope that Mary has finally found rest.
I told them, I told them, you just don't mess with Haynes. And they didn't listen to me. See, now, now they got her riled up, but I got to go ahead and She's liable to go around and start setting fire to any house she wants in town. <laughs> they got her mad now. So uh, and they, they didn't listen to me. You just don't mess with Haynes. I, I think Mary was trying to get at me. <laughs> she thought I, she was mad because I played a bad job of her in the haunted house. <laughs> I'm so sorry I did it now. I, I can't take it anymore. I think I'm going to live with my sister in Kentucky. I, I hope she doesn't follow me there, too. I find it quite intriguing that what held true for her in life holds true after death. She is still forsaken and misunderstood from those whom she sought comfort. I feel that what we have now is basically a homeless ghost. <laughs> Mary will wander the streets of Midway in search of refuge. It's my sincere hope that she will come and abide with me. I can lead her to eternal rest. Am I actually? No, uh-uh. No, uh, that's the best thing could ever happen. Best thing could ever happen. You thought it was big before. Wait till people find out that Mary went around and set fire to her own house. Oh, it'll be bigger than ever. Matter of fact, we've already decided we will rebuild the house. Uh, I've been talking to this boy. Uh, he's down in Nashville. He's, over, he's done, talking about maybe uh, having, uh, like Mary, a special effect. So Mary go around and set fire to different things, like, like backdraft, like backdraft, something like that. And uh, <laughs> so uh, I already told the paper about it, so they, they got it covered. <laughs> well, if there's one thing I hope, buddy, I hope they don't find out that it was me and Mary that done it. But I ain't worried, because she told me. She said, Stuart, it's going to be all right. And I believe it, too. That's all I'm going to say now. It's going to be all right. 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 Um, Robert Dale, um, he, he was actually a real client when I worked in mental health for a while, uh, for six years, and uh, he originally was a bank robber, uh, that's a, a true thing, <laughs> he was a bank robber for a while, and uh, he was very, very kind of needy, he, he, he had very little to say, actually in this, in this show, uh, the only kind of forced part about Robert is the fact that he did speak uh, for more than one sentence at a time. When I would go in to see Robert uh, at, at the house that he worked at, he lived in a, in a group home with uh, two other people, uh, he would just simply just sit up and say one line at a time, you know, just um, Brent pissed on the floor again, that sort of thing, and then and, and just lay back down and sleep, and then we would hear another line occasionally, he's like, he's crazy, you know, 
and then he would lay down. And uh, he was actually a very gentle kind of person, although he put up a very tough front. You know, he's like, I robbed banks, I'll do it again, too. And he, he had this whole thing about wanting to go back to, uh, to Western State, to the uh, mental health facility, the hospital, uh, because he had a girlfriend, et cetera, et cetera, which is a whole other story. But um, he would come up with these concoctions about how to go back in the hospital. He said, um, you know, I, I know how to go back again. All you have to do is go into a bank and hold your finger up like this, and, and they'll come and get you right away. <laughs> I kind of guess they would, I guess. So, yeah. My name's Robert Dale. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm now in Kentucky now. I've been here for a few years, since 96. And I, I haven't been, well, my sister hasn't been here to try to bother me anymore. And uh, I moved away, you know. Although one time I, I, I got up in the night and I, uh, I went to do my business. And, uh, and I, I, th I thought I'd seen something out the window. But, but I, now I keep the shade closed so I can't, I can't see anything in the middle of the night anymore. I, I, I go to sleep with Jay Leno on. That way you don't get so scared that way. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and I think that sometimes I, uh, I, 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 I think I, I can uh, hear music. But then I realized I live in a duplex, so it's probably the woman next door. I don't know. I hope so. They're, they're, they're Asian. Okay. Um, Opal is based on an, a, a grandmother of a friend of mine from Kentucky, who is now deceased. And she, um, very, very sweet person. Um, basically how you see her in the show is how she, how she really, really was. And um, just just a very gentle soul, always uh, very hospitable, always ready to bring you in and sit you down and give you some, you know, just traditional kind of grandmother, like cookies and that sort of thing. I always think of Opal as having um, a wet hands. It's like she was always wiping something off and then greeting you uh, with <laughs> these little gentle wet hands and sitting you down in her, uh, in, in, in her place there. Um, so yeah, just a very a tender, a, a grandmotherly kind of person. My name is Opal Avery, and I have lived in the town for many years. Uh, we, when I was a girl, moved when I was 10 years old to Midway uh, from deep down southern Tennessee, down near Memphis. and. Uh, I have lived there for many years, like I said, and uh, I worked for a little while as a librarian in the town. And then I retired shortly after because I had some health problems. Now, I knew Mary for many, many years, and uh, it was an interesting story because now her family and my family was really close. You see, uh, her brother uh, was some years older than her. And uh, he would teach music lessons. And so he would teach me to play the piano and that sort of thing. And so that's where I learned music, too. And occasionally I go in and help the children out uh, at, the, at the school system to substitute teach. And uh, now Miss Floyd, which is Carlotta's mother, designed what they have now as the music system there in Midway. And so me, me and her got close too in, in doing that, you know, because I love the children. I love the children. And we would play records, you know, and do little dance around and that sort of thing. And they, and they were so sweet. Children are so nice. Um, it's interesting. I think Carlotta is the second oldest character I've done. I, I found the character, basically, I, I would say I found the character under a stairwell which is sort of true. I uh, was working as a janitor in, at uh, my university, Anderson University in Indiana, and uh, was cleaning up under a stairwell and found a, uh, a wig. Uh, it was, I think it was like a rush week or something of that nature where they, they were rushing for fraternities, etc. And I uh, took this wig back, d literally dusted it off. It, was, it had cobwebs and everything on it. Dusted it off and, and, and it, <laughs> it literally fit my head perfectly. And uh, from looking in the mirror and seeing this wig on my head, it just came this character. Carlotta is based on three actual people, uh, one of which is dead and the other two are still living. One is of uh, is, is my own mother and one is my friend's mother from high school and the other was my grandfather who is now deceased. 
Uh, yeah, Carlotta has her own show called Carlotta's Late Night Wingding that's performed here in Seattle. Uh, that show is basically a, um, it's kind of like a, a crash between, uh, if, you, if you mixed uh, Pee Wee's Playhouse Late Night with David Letterman and, and, and The Muppet Show all together somehow, I think that's kind of what her show is like. It is an interview show where we have actual real guests on and then the rest of the show is run by her friends and family, whoever she can gather up. Uh, that are also, of course, character actors, and um, including the sound guy, the ticket person, the bartender, everybody uh, we, that we can possibly get to be a character in the show is in the show, and you come in our, and, and uh, inhabit this space that, that is hers. She uh, is kind of portrayed a little bit different than I do her, uh, say, if she's doing the wing ding. This is an earlier point of this character's life uh, in the whole history of things. Uh, uh, she now lives in, in Seattle. This is before she moved to Seattle. She is living in Midway. And I think since she's moved to Seattle, she's become a gentler, uh, kinder person, and she's not so harsh and brash. And she's learned a lot of life lessons since she's been here in Seattle, I think. And in, in The Haint, uh, she's very much... Um, <laughs> she, she really uh, is kind of one-sided, or not one-sided, but she sees things one way in, in The Haint. You know, she really wants her side of things done. And, and we've certainly given her a foil in the uh, in the haint. Uh, one of the reasons that Luann Wooten came about, the whole character, was that somebody said, Carlotta loves everybody. And and I said, yeah, you know, that's interesting. Why, why don't we have one person that she just absolutely hates that brings all the worst out in her? And that's kind of kind of why you see that side in, in the haint more so than in the wingding, is that she really doesn't have that kind of a foil in, in the wingding that she does in the hate and, and in the hate it's very very clear you know there's a very clear purpose in mind that she just dislikes Luann um, also you know because Luann cusses and that's the biggest thing one of the biggest things for Carlotta and smoke two of the major major no-nos so yeah that's kind of a difference too is that all? huh? you got it just talk into it again all right. Well, they come out here uh, to Seattle now and want me to talk about the, the different things that we had and that we that we've done in the show. And uh, well, I like it out here. Uh, and my husband, I've divorced him. Fred, uh, he's divorced. He worked over at Bowens's when he was sober. Now I work at the uh, Value Village now and have my own little place over there and uh, live with a German woman. Named Magundi Lindy, fly stinger, and now and she's with me when we have my own little show that we do. And now, uh, then we had us a dwarf, a dwarf, dwarf on the show, a little fella, and now uh, and he was cute. You know, I seen one on uh, where they had one on uh, the Three Stooges, and I said, well, we ought to have us one on. And so he was good, but you know, you have to watch. They like to steal. They see them little shiny things, and then go have to go out and get it. You know. And so, uh, but now he's gone now. I reckon he went back to Hawaii with his wife. And, and so, but they live over there. And, uh, and my son Kenny's in jail in Los Angeles. He moved out here. And uh, he worked for the postal office so many years, uh, you know, a little few years back. And now he uh, unfortunately has the Secret Syndrome where they yell and speak out and yell different things. And so uh, I don't think that's why he was in jail. They said he tried to set Roseanne Barr's house on fire. I don't know if that's true. I don't think it is. Although he had pictures drawn of it with crayons where he had done it. But I don't know if, I, I don't think he's done it. But of course, he's in jail down there now in Los Angeles, you know. And, I, uh, and then, of course, now let's see. I'm hoping to do more shows here in Seattle where I have my own thing that I do. You know, and uh, it's... Uh, it's real fun, and we've had different ones on. We've uh, we've had the Lisbon's on, the foreigners. Uh, they're, they're different. They have their own bar and everything here, their own side of town. Everything they have, and uh, and it's really something. But they don't talk with the accent, but they're real friendly to each other. And there's only women's of them. That's all. What I've noticed, just the women Lisbon. They don't have men Lisbon. I don't know why. I reckon they're probably treated bad over there, and so they all come here. But uh, they've got that here, and they've, it's, it's a big city, you know, and lots of different things here. And I've went up in the Space Needle, Elvis was there, and uh, I didn't see where that, you know, they didn't keep nothing of his there. I reckon I thought they would, but they didn't. 
And so, uh, but I stayed there a while, drank my coffee, and thought about what he's seen while he was there. And uh, boy, they've got lots of coffee. I'll tell you what, you come out here, honey, and you look like they've robbed South America. I mean, they've got so much out here, and it stinks. I don't drink it of a morning. I like my tea Lipton's with a little tag on it, and I save them sometimes, and you can make little art projects out of it. Uh, and I made a little happy face, and I give it to different ones for birthdays and Christmas. It has Lipton on it, you know. And then you give them a little box of tea with it. It's a neat little gift, if you think about it. I, and uh, I'd like to get my own Martha Stewart show kind of going now that she's gone under. And maybe, uh, you know, because somebody's got to fill in her place and do the foofy booby. And so that's what I figure I'll do. That's about it. Uh, yeah, Luann Wooten. Um, <laughs> no, I can say this, you know. <laughs> Luann Wooten is a, is, a, is a combination of, uh, of two people, um, both of which I really, really like. Uh, and just because the character kind of has this brash quality to her um, doesn't mean that I didn't like the people that I fashioned her after. If she is a marriage of a, um, a dance instructor from, that I knew from college that... Uh, uh, who, who still, I think, <laughs> instructs in dancing today. She must be in her late 70s, if not early 80s now, um, whose, whose name was Lou. And uh, yeah, her first name was Lou. And um, she just had a very brash quality to her, but she was full of life and that kind of thing, and let's, let's get dancing. And she'd always say about her feet after rehearsing, she'd say, oh, my balls hurt. And of course, she was talking about the balls of her feet, and we just thought it was hysterical, you know, as <laughs> being learning from her. Uh, but I only had her in a musical, because uh, I, I, and I was in a couple of musicals in college, and she would try, try to teach me to dance. And, and <laughs> I just remember in Oklahoma, I was playing Hallie Hackam, and, and finally she gets so tired of trying to make me dance that she says, Oh, to hell with it! Why don't you just do whatever you want? So <laughs> that's, <laughs> that was kind of Lou. Uh, she was very spry and very, very, actually very, very cool and neat person. Uh, the other person is based on is a, uh, a person named Anne who is, uh, runs a theater here in town who is the smoking part of, of the character and is also a um, very, uh, uh, just a very interesting person. And um, she, uh, I, I kind of married the two of those together, together and that's where the character came from. <laughs> No, she's gonna see this. Okay. Uh, Anne is. Uh, she's smoking. My God, I can't believe it. Is how are you? She was very, very. Uh, she's very nice person, but very brash. So if you mix the two of those together, you kind of get that's. You can see where the marriage comes in, and you know you add a little bit of spitefulness to the character. Uh, neither of which of these these actual people have that kind of spike to them, thank God. But uh, but uh, yeah, so it's kind of that dry kind of um, older character that I was aiming for. Yeah, <laughs> just <laughs> just don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> I don't know. Anne probably doesn't have a, even have a DVD player. So <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, how do you work it? <laughs> anyway. Uh, uh, <sorry. laughs> I got ashes inside. I don't know what happened. <laughs> okay. Well, they got in touch with me here because, you know, I hadn't talked to people in a long time. I finally moved out of that ret rack place down there and I moved up to uh, Nashville now. I live here in Nashville. There's a nice little place. You, know, you, you don't have to live directly in the city. You can live, there's some little suburbs. I lived on Nolensville Road for a while out there, you know. And it's okay. I mean, I'm used to the north, but it's all right living down south. I've got some nice neighbors here and some good friends. You know, I moved from Chicago originally to, uh, to be down here at Midway. I owned an art store up there for many years and, uh, and then eventually sold it off for a decent price. And now I, uh, I'm here. So it's, it's all right, you know, I, once you've moved out of that place, I don't know what they've done with it. I haven't gone back there since. I moved out about, oh, three months after they made the whole documentary thing. 
And uh, yeah, for the most part, I've, I've sold a couple of my pieces here in Nashville. People have seem to have an appreciation for it. I can do portraits. I've done those before. They have little local fairs and that sort of thing. So I do that. And I've been getting crank calls from somebody. I don't know who it is, but it's somebody that, and I think you know who I think it is, but I don't know. I, I, it comes across as unavailable on my little caller ID. I keep one of those around now. And I, it, it could be coming long distance, I don't know. But whoever it is is trying to sound like a man's voice. Now, I have a lot of friends with a little lower voice than I do, but I don't think it's them. I mean, they're not the sort of thing to say, because they had a dialect, you know, they sounded kind of Southern, saying something about, um, are there any fires around my neighborhood lately, and that sort of thing. So I, uh, I try to keep it, you know, in check. Now I have one of those things where you have to push a one before you come through the thing, so, so that you can kind of keep a little of the riffraff out. But uh, so far, it's not to the point where it's harassment. It's just every once in a while, two in the morning, you know, that sort of thing. So I, I keep it on, I keep it, just let, let the answering machine get it now. I've learned my lesson since then. <laughs> okay. Stuart Price Floyd is, is, is the real name. And actually, if you notice on the tape, it is uh, missed misspelled on the thing, and that, that was just a pure accident. Uh, the guy that did the slides, who was a great job of the uh, the slides, by the way, his name is Sean Stearns, and a very, very dear person, and uh, it actually wanted to, had, we had a whole other idea with the show, uh, with slides, where he was going to do all these different things with the different gestures of the of the characters, etc., and then in the end, uh, because of the direction, we ended up going with just the names. But anyway, the the name did accidentally get mixed around, and the real name of Stuart is is he's a real person, uh, and there is no kind of marriage of characters with him. That is purely Stuart. Uh, his real name is Stuart Price Floyd, and um, and Stuart can tell you a little bit more about where the name came from a little later. But he uh, is a, is a schizophrenic and development disabled, and lives with my parents presently, and he's probably in his he's probably reaching close to seventy. He's sixty six now, I think, something like that. And a very heavy set kind of person, which is kind of hard to portray. Although you know, I'm probably gaining on him, <laughs> but but uh, he is kind of hard to portray, and and that the physical sense of him. But uh, voices, the story that that Stuart tells in in the uh, he is uh, verbatim uh, a story that he had told me about the two men standing at the end of the bed with the um, the Ku Klux Klan outfits, but it's not Ku Klux Klan. I mean, all of that is literally the way he told me the story, except for the fact that he doesn't say he can see ghosts. Uh, the actual story ends with him saying that's how he was called to be a minister. And so some of his, um, the voices, etc., are, are, are telling him that he's a minister and he has a wife, etc., which brings out some interesting comedic moments with my mom sometimes, <laughs> who says that he's lying. Uh, he's, he's a very dear kind of person and very, very jovial, happy person, but um, can be some when you when you hear some of the voices going on can be kind of scary to hear <laughs> kind of eerie just as the story itself is eerie and when he told me the story originally uh, it was amazing how it kind of fit with what we were doing in the haint and I Stuart came out to um, see the haint and, and is it actually uh, I had asked him for permission before I, I per portrayed him and he of course was very happy to do that he, he loves the fact that I portray him and uh, it has become quite his own little star in the show. People don't believe that he's a real person. I mean, I'm constantly saying, yes, and he's exactly like this. Matter of fact, when my relatives see the, uh, <laughs> the show, laugh especially because they, they can't believe that I'm doing him so closely the way that, that he is. And um, he came out, and, and unfortunately, he got very, very ill the, the, the night that he had arrived on the plane and was sick the entire rest of the run. And I ended up having to go back to Kentucky. I was, had planned to go back, and he was going to ride back with me on the plane. He had to stay in Seattle, still in the hospital. It was a very terrible decision to have to make, and very tough decision to make. But in the end, the doctors were like, no, you have to go back, and he'll be okay. And they saw that he got on the plane. And he still insists <laughs> that the uh, president of the hospital rode back with him on the plane and told him to come back to Seattle and see him. And he said he wanted him to come back out again just so he could see my show, which I thought was a, a very dear thing. And he still, to this day, talks about that, much to the chagrin of my mother, who insists that the president did not ride on the plane. But uh, So uh, he, he still wants to come out to Seattle and still talks about it, and hopefully he'll get him out of here again soon. soon. All right.
uh, just now thinking, okay. My name is Stuart Price Floyd. That ain't my name, my bar. My name is Stuart Price Floyd. And they got it wrong in the show, too, but they get it. I don't know why they done it wrong. But I just let it go. I said, leave it to Jesus. That's what I said. You can't get mad about it, but But I know what I know. They put me in that awful place. And I hate every one of them for those. But now I got my own place. But they put me in this nice house. I live here with different ones. And they are the ones that are good Christians. But the good Christian people come over and take care of me. And God knows what the bad ones done to me and how they put me over there. And he'll get them. I'll sue every one of them for everything they work, but the boy, I'll tell you what, you know what I like is Joan Davis to make a scrub down. And she makes it now. Buddy. And so does uh, Sister Viola Cole. They come over from the church, and I thank God. Buddy. I love every one of them. Because they come and bring me over chicken salad same. And then one time they took me over to, oh, what's that place? Golden Corral. Where they got all you can eat, fish and roast beef and mashed potatoes and everything you want, but then you go back all you want. And I loved it. And so does Carlotta. Carlotta says she loved to go over there when she come back. Now she lived in out there in Seattle. I, I still live here in Midway, in the different ones. And they take care of it too, but I thank God for it. I Mayor Corbin Husker is based on a real person um, who was not a mayor, but uh, he was my, I guess he would be my great uncle. Yeah, something. he was a relative of my, my father. And uh, he uh, would, uh, he, he had that kind of stutter. My, my grandfather called him Porky Pig, not to his face. But, um, and uh, <laughs> I, I, it's interesting in, in, in describing uh, Bill, I almost think of... Um, my grandfather describing which he was like he's he was tighter and he's so tight he's afraid to go to the bathroom afraid he'd lose something and uh, he he talked about him just uh, one time he talked about him as a, he called him uh, I'm sorry <laughs> he, he would uh, he talked about him one time going when he was at the grocery store and that uh, Bill had had a uh, a uh, a bag full of um, cream puffs I think my grandfather's talking about him he said the longer I talked to him more he held tight on them he thought I was going to grab one from him and uh, so Bill was was that kind of the part of the picture of the the of my my great uncle with him being tight, kind of with money, going you know, to fit into the whole idea of this mayor that was very much money hungry and 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 kind of fit into that whole thing. So so Bill kind of fit into this naturally with his character, and he did he, he kind of stutter a little bit. But when he stutter, it's like it's like he gets so much behind what he was saying that he couldn't get it all out in time. It's like it's like even behind that word, there were ten more. That were ready to come out, so it was that kind of idea. Uh, it, it, I think it more than stuttering as it was, it just there's it's so tight to tell about a different thing, and that was the way Bill was, uh, and he is now deceased as well, unfortunately. So, unfortunately, this kind of uh, comic portrayal of him is is one way, I guess, of of, of having him live on, as well as the other characters uh, who, who live on that are now deceased as well. Uh, well, uh, uh, glad to see you. And, uh, glad they, they haven't had the cameras out here in a little while. And so I figured, uh, glad to see you. To see you, I can tell you a little bit of what's going on now. Well, uh, most, most of the time, uh, they, they got well, the, the haunted house thing, they, they fell through. They fell through. Uh, they couldn't get the uh, fire regulations out just right because we want to have everything get, get set on fire again and, 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 and caught on fire again. So uh, and nothing, nothing there. Now we figured just let leave, let 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 let, let no, well enough alone. And uh, so instead, I was thinking about putting in a water slide. Uh, you know, something uh, have maybe a religious theme or something because the PTL them got away with it a long time ago, and so maybe uh, you would have something about the Holy Ghost water slide or something, you know, and 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 uh, and then uh, 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 crucifix, uh, you know, uh, kind of kind of a, a log flume or something, you know, well, water theme to it because uh, it's hot down here, it gets hot a lot, and uh, maybe you know people drive by and say, well, look at all the water, what they're doing, so they come in and come to see it, 
Uh, and uh, uh, we thought about having a, uh, you know, a holy roller coaster, you know, something like that. Uh, so they could have different ones, you know, scream, oh, Lord, help, Lord. So, you know, they pray and they're going down. Uh, it's just a thought. It's just a thought. I, I've been tossing around with different ones uh, over there uh, to the town hall. Uh, and, of course, we need something. We need something. Uh, There's not much going on here. They, they did build a... a they call it a multiplex, only they just added another screen. So I guess, you know, it's more than one, so it's multi uh, in that sense. And uh, they show the 3D features and that sort of thing. But I, but I, I think if, you, if you're going to come through here, you, you ought to remember to stop by. Uh, we have a special restaurant, and right now uh, we're calling it uh, 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 Satan's Fire of Hot Dogs. And uh, it's uh, kind of got that theme to it, and it's got good, they got good hot dogs. Reverend Roy Root, uh, I should apologize to two of the, uh, I, I took the uh, names, the name came from two ministers I had growing up with, uh, uh, a, a, a Roy Ferguson and then it was a, a, a Pastor Root, Laverne Root, so I stole the name, the uh, character comes, has nothing to do with those actual people. It's this very apocalyptic kind of uh, messenger who speaks in these apocalyptic kind of phrases that actually doesn't mean anything, but yet it does. Uh, and and my friend Mike, who I spoke of David Byrne earlier, loves David Byrne's songs, and in, in writing this piece, kind of thought of how David Byrne uses these phrases that are kind of almost nonsensical in a way, but in a bizarre kind of way, do present some sort of uh, Picasso-like picture with words. And the sermon is kind of like that. He speaks about you know different things, and it, and it sounds like something a minister would say. Um, and we just kind of he kind of threw them all together. And in uh, and, and doing the ministry, I just kind of gathered a bunch of um, images from my mind of growing up of what we called camp meeting uh, at the time that we went to as kids. It was up in the mountains, in the hills of Kentucky. And uh, they were just kind of these, you know, these, these ministers who were very, very dramatic in their presentation, you know, that a lot of the, up, the hands up in the air and, and very, very, very passionate about what they were saying, which to me is where the humor in this character comes in, is he's very passionate about something that makes no sense, which to me caught a lot of the feeling of how it felt to be a kid hearing some of this. So you're like, oh, I kind of know what that means. The boy sure is passionate about it, but what's he doing with it? So, the, But the whole feel of the piece is what we wanted. So I think it kind of captures that, that feeling of sometimes what it can be like to sit under the southern minister uh, and, and feel, feel like that. I don't hate Bill Cosby. I never did. I like pudding pops and refrigerated products. I like walking down the freezer and noticing all the bright colors that jump out at you from the cold. But the thing that I'm worried about is what's going on here today. What are we doing? Why do we sit here when we could be up walking around? I don't want to aerobicize. I don't want to read about Michael Jackson having a thing with a monkey? Is that what life has become? Headlines and horse poop. <laughs> Out take. He's the hardest one to do, isn't he? Yeah, he is because all that was so written. You just have to, uh, let me try it again. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Maybe we can patchwork something together of all of it. <laughs> It's just like speaking non sequitur. Okay. <laughs> Sheriff Sam Gruntley. Uh, Sam has a brother, uh, Jim Gruntley, that uh, is in the same town. And I had performed this character, Jim Gruntley, at uh, the Market Theater with Unexpected Productions a couple years before The Haint. And it was a, a show where he played the uh, theater manager of this... Uh, we were doing this thing of these serial matinees that the kids would go to, like Flash Gordon, etc. And it was an improvised version of this kind of show, this style, the science feature. And I played this Jim Gruntley who was in charge of the, the movie theater. And I liked the character so much that I thought, well, let's make a brother who's the, the uh, Sam, who's, the, who's his brother, who's the mayor, or the, excuse me, the sheriff of the town. And so uh, that's kind of where the character came from. And I caught a lot of the same types of things that, uh, that Jim did. 
Only, of course, you know, Sam, of course, is now the sheriff and, and his brother's there. So uh, that's kind of where that character came from. Just kind of somebody, you know, who knows a lot about nothing. You know, who thinks he does, you know. He's just in very trying to be very authoritative. And we've all run across those kind of people in our lives. And I kind of wanted to capture that feeling about, I've got it all under control kind of thing. And, uh, you know, just, just kind of a laughable, fun character, I think. Uh, Sheriff Sam Gruntley, and uh, I'm still sheriff, proud to be sheriff again. And things have uh, calmed down quite a bit since that little rough time period we had. We did have a little uh, instance of uh, little thievery going on in some little stores, uh, people stealing uh, packs of chewing gum, and clothespins, it's all they'd steal. Wouldn't steal cassette tapes, nothing, we just had a clothespin and chewing gum. And they'd start stealing that. We, and they finally caught who it was, a little 13-year-old girl. And uh, they figured out uh, when she, she'd come to church with her uh, purse that was bulging. And for whatever reason, she'd keep all that. In, and I don't know what she was building a project or what, but we caught her. And uh, I was on top of that as soon as they uh, come in there. And they brought the paper in, took pictures. <clears throat> with me standing there next to her in cuffs. So uh, everything's under control now. But, uh, yeah, I, my brother he lives here, and uh, he's made it a multiplex over there at the cinema. And they got that uh, foofy boy that works there and running the thing. And I don't know, I still keep an eye on him. I put one of them little webcams in his apartment. He don't know about it. But you never know about anything like that. And it's legal as long as you, uh, you know, you catch him doing something. Of course, you know, if they catch other footage up until they got something caught and then it ain't legal so i figured maybe i was going to open my own business maybe I have my own line of webcams you know you can put them anywhere you won't people can't hardly see it and uh, maybe it have to save me from going out and trying to catch speeders i just put a webcam out on one of them trees next to the main highway there and if they see them going too fast of a blur well then i pick up the <laughs> little license plate and go in there and do that <laughs> and get, you got them on camera to see that and they can't get away. <laughs> All right, Reginald Buchwald Favon is a, uh, it, it started off, I, I did a, once again at the Market Theater with Unexpected Productions, I did a character whose name was Stanley Quinton Thick, And the inspiration for this, for Reginald Buchwald Favon came from this kind of character that I worked on, which was through a Mike Lee process. Mike Lee directed uh, Her Secrets and Lies and uh, Topsy Turvy and Naked and the, those kinds of films, those films. And uh, we were doing this process and I started working on this character so intensely uh, and that I, but I wanted to make a different, this character was really, really a heavy-handed kind of character, Stanley Quentin Thick was, so I kind of wanted to make a lighter-hearted comical version and so that's where Bucky came from. Um, and of course he insists if, on being called Buchwald. At times, you know, people can be uh, really picky about their names and I kind of wanted to catch the kind of comedy of, of this character being one of those people who would be picky about their name. And so that's kind of where Bucky comes up with, with, with his name. Uh, and the character is actually uh, making partly fun of me mainly, because uh, I went through a period of being really fascinated with occult kinds of things, and the tarot and runes, and just interested about what that was. And uh, so in, in kind of making light of myself and how seriously I take things sometimes and how tragically I, you know, I had consumed myself at times, I wanted to create a character that, that could make fun of that and, and to keep myself in check and realize that you know, I don't take things so seriously sometimes. So. With Bucky, he uh, definitely had, he's moved to the town um, because he had had a, uh, a crush on this guy that worked at, a, um, at an, an antique shop there. And it was a torrid affair, and the guy ended up leaving the antique shop and left Bucky now who, to where he works in the projection room of the cinema uh, of Jim Gruntley, Sam Gruntley's brother. And so now that's what he does, and he's kind of stuck there. He's originally from Minnesota, and so now he's stuck living in, in in that town and he feels like you know he, he's miles above any of these other characters and and the other people in the town and he feels like they're just so uncultured and, and that, that they that it's just a pain for him to live there and he's desperately trying to save money to move out of the town but until he moves out perhaps he can somehow make contact with the other world and get a little publicity and, and at the same time so 
Um, my name is Reginald Bilqual Favon, and this lighting is really, this lighting is very harsh. There's not, huh? There's nothing we can do. I try to stay out of harsh lighting. I'm sorry, but um, it's it's very tough on your skin, and I have special fluorescent lighting that I put in my apartment that's uh, a, a light blue color because it evokes peace and serenity and I have that and, and I also have candle lighting which is actually very good for your aura as well. It kind of makes your aura gold all the way down. And so I'm still living here in Midway. I'm originally from Austin, Wisconsin, which is not Austin, Texas. There is a different place. Austin is the home down of Hormel meatpacking plant and, uh, and, and yes, of Spam and that is where they make Spam and that's where I'm from originally. Um, and if you watch the documentary called American Job or something like that, I can't remember what it's called, um, it is about our town and you'll see that there was a, a, a bad times there where we, they went on strike, etc. And I had a little scuffle there uh, that I won't go into details about, but it almost involved the death of a person that I got very violent because he was calling me derogatory names that I won't mention on a tasteful documentary like this. Um, but anyway, he called me that and, and I got really upset. At the same time I had been seeing a friend and um, he had said he was from a small town and I needed help to just get out of the situation and so I moved to Midway, which is where I'm still at now. And I um, work right now for The Multiplex, which we recently made a multiplex. It took me years of convincing James Gruntley to expand and now we have another screen so we have more than one multiplex and uh, so uh, I am the projectionist and recently joined the union. Thank you. And uh, so now I am involved in the film business I like to think uh, of, of, of being you know one of the helpers of getting all the major you know, manufacturing to you, the viewing audience. And I'm the final person that says, roll it. You know, and then when I say, then you watch the film. So that's how I got involved in the film business. And um, uh, yes, and now, uh, because the guy that I was, the person, the friend that I had had that was at the antique store is no longer here, and so now I'm here still uh, and trying to save up money so I can move to another location very soon, hopefully, um, because I have recently begun uh, uh, online with my tarot reading and rune reading, and I uh, occasionally drive to Nashville and do a taping of the public access show called "Ruining Your Life," and um, it is about you know reading runes and telling you what could happen. So it's a call-in show. So if you're in Nashville and uh, it's on at three o'clock in the afternoon on Thursdays. Uh, they are the public access channel. You can call up and I'll, I'll read your roots for you or tarot or whatever I happen to have around me at the dime. So please look it up. I would love to have you call me up. And um, if you're in Midway, please stop by the multiplex and ask for the projectionist. i will be glad to see you. Can you turn that down? Otis... Um, Otis is a, is a compilation of people I grew up with um, that uh, just basically in the South that he grew up with. He's probably uh, one of the uh, least developed characters as far as he doesn't have as much of a history as some of the other characters. Um, he, we wanted to basically have a character that shared some sort of other experience in the piece that uh, had had direct experience with the ghost. Otis and Stuart are the only uh, characters that do actually talk about seeing the ghost. Uh, and I think it, we needed that kind of extra account. And I think with Otis, he kind of adds the typical story that we all hear in ghost stories. You know, I didn't believe in ghosts until, you know, this kind of account. And I think that was kind of the importance of the character being in the piece. And, uh, yeah, and showing some sort of validity to well, this person, ha this ghost has been seen by more than one person. Okay. So I just sit down and hear, uh, do y'all have paper and things? I didn't know you were going to have no camera. I ain't do. I told y'all enough in the show. That's all I'm going to say. The tourists. Um, 
Yeah, let's see. I'm trying. I can't remember the exact order they come in, but I think the first one was uh, Phil McCracken, and uh, that name was a groaner because uh, Tom and I uh, just Je Jeff came up with the name, and, it, and it's, of course it's a, you know it's, it's the bad kind of play that you, you know, play in on uh, on words that you know you'd call somebody. I was like, hi, what's your name, Phil? Phil what? Phil McCracken, you know. So so it's that kind of thing where. Uh, Jeff insisted on having it, and Tom and I just groaned when he wanted to do it. So in the end, we're like, okay, we'll have Phil McCracken. So I don't know how many people pick up on that joke, but uh, it's supposed to be a joke, albeit a groaner. Uh, so yeah, then they, and that's the character I think that, that changed literally every night. I'd do, okay, how am I going to do him tonight? Uh, so he wasn't really based on anybody. It was just kind of like a, a little, somewhat of an improv character moment. Uh, than I did. So hopefully he's at least consistent on the taping. <laughs> uh, then there's uh, uh, Harry Graham, which was based on a, a client of mine, which I can't say his real name, um, but uh, that I'd had before, who kept saying he had uh, an Irish temper and he was going to, he could hit somebody at any time. And he kind of had that, but he talked kind of slow. And you're like, oh my gosh, if this guy even raises a fist up, it'll be a, a major uh, accomplishment. So he was based on uh, just that that character, and I don't want to say too much about him because he's he, like he's still a uh, he's a real person. And uh, and then there's uh, Carol Chioko, which is actually a real name. Uh, my friend's mother, uh, who I think she knows that I have her on tape, uh, but she used to call all the time and leave messages for Paul, who's Paul, her son, and she would say, "My God, Paul, are you okay? Please tell Paul I called." So, uh, and, and Paul always drinks coffee, continually has coffee mug, and he talked about his mother he used to fall asleep in the chair in New Jersey, is where they're from. She would fall asleep with caffeinated coffee cup in her hand, with drinking caffeinated coffee in her hand, driving on the chair. It's like, it's amazing. From morning to night, they're always drinking coffee. So that's the joke of the, the coffee comes in. So, yeah, she's a real person. So we can say, hi, Carol. <laughs> I know what you come for. You come to see me tell you the truth. You'll never kill me because I've been dead since I was born. I am Janine Jones. I'm so sick of justice I can puke. The baby killer. <laughs> a good murder? Like a good meal. Beautiful, isn't it? They had no right to laugh at me. The army of the night is waiting, stabbing her again. Because I have to do the thinking. And again, and again. Not in! Oh! And again. I'll leave you on the floor dying in your own blood. <sighs> There's really no control at this point. I'd like to make a person-to-person -person call, please. This is Orson Welles. There I was, 
A 24-year-old wunderkin being handed the key to the city. Hilton told me I was an extraordinary young man. I said, I know. Who knows? Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? The shadow knows. <laughs> <laughs> With one film, I had established myself as the most exciting director now working. If I had half the power these people attribute to me, I could rule the fucking world! Only one critic dared to speak against it. It was the last one he ever gave. New Jersey was being destroyed! They had to save themselves! <laughs> we cannot allow a studio pissing contest to compromise this picture. Who should I blame? You're destroying my greatest work and all over a single screening and the fear of losing your job. Yes, it's tragic. But it's also very beautiful. My identity has been almost exclusively homosexual my entire life from my first erotic dream at age 10, all the way through to this morning, when this guy, Jake, woke me up by thwacking my forehead with his penis. <laughs> but never have I seriously questioned my homosexuality, which, even when I considered it my impediment, always felt as natural to me as my desires to eat food, breathe air, and fear clowns. <laughs> all of us have sacrifices to make to live in accordance with Cher's teachings. If you don't have a dick in your mouth, the theory goes, you must be straight. <laughs> I've read the book of Leviticus, and aside from the ban on same-sex sex, it's like Martha Stewart living BC. <laughs> Who said anything about the Lord? Scott said it's his dad that makes him hot for guys. There you go. <laughs> oh no, she said, he's a never gay. I had difficulty believing that heterosexuality might be induced through an activity that required wearing a leotard. <laughs> Rescuing the cuter conversion boys by inviting them over for an ostensibly chaste and godly potluck, where I'd spike the food with ecstasy, pop in the video power tool, and watch the liberation begin. <laughs>